Welcome to Conductor's Talk, everyone. Great to see you, the live audience, and welcome to all of you who also see this show digital. My name is Fred Sjöberg, and I'm the Senior Artistic Director of Interkultur and Vice President in the World Choir Council. I have the pleasure to be your host today. I'm very happy to bring to you a very good friend since many years and a fantastic musician, a wonderful clinician and an impressive music director in the core life in the United States. Please welcome today's guest, Dr. Tim Sharp. Hi, great to see you, Tim. Hope everything is fine where, are, where you are. Where are you, by the way? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia today in the US and uh, great to see you, Fred. Thank you. Looking forward to a wonderful time together. lovely music and with some lovely pictures from studios as well. What was that that we listened to? That was my, uh, what I call my river medley. It's a medley of three Appalachian uh, southern uh, hymns, folk hymns, that I've arranged for choir and uh, my group called Kentucky Harmony, a uh, professional uh, young ensemble that I direct, uh, as well as a bluegrass band that I play in. So it's a fusion, Fred. It's a fusion of uh, uh, old folkloric uh, pieces, modern bluegrass instrumentation, and choral uh, uh, counterpoint and homophonic writing that kind of brings it to a, a different level of choral expression. Yeah, thank you very much. Lovely to see you playing the banjo as well. Thank you. <laughs> Tim Sharp, who is he? Well, <laughs> Tim recently concluded 13 years as executive director of ACDA, American Choral Directors Association. Many of us had had the privilege to explore the wonderful and important work that you have done in that position. Thank you. But you have so many other things that maybe the international audience is not so familiar with. 
Beside your administration work, you are also a great musician, a composer and an arranger. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the program. You conduct choirs and orchestras around the world with major choral works as well as your special interest in folk music. Tim has also been awarded for his music contribution contribution for, from many universities, as well as Grammy nominations. Tim also now are a member in the Internet, uh, Intercultural World Choir Council Advisory Board. Thank you for having that position. Last but not least, you do a lot of research focused on pedagogic and score analysis. We can see some covers of your latest releases. I hope I got the most important thing now of your career team. There's so much more to say. Here is your insight for conduct the sacred choral of music repertoire. Today's show will include some very exciting tips about how to develop your choir as well as yourself as conductor. Many secrets are going to be told, I think. Later in the show, you can see the bullet points of what Tim are sharing with us here today. So please stay with us. Tim, before we start to share ideas and tips, I must ask you, we have been together, you and I, in so many different occasions around the world. And uh, would you please share some exotic moments? Is there something special that comes to your mind? Ah, well, it's a, it's a fun story, Fred. Uh, you and I have traveled uh, China to, uh, my goodness, we've been all over Europe. We've, we were just talking about our time in Manhattan and New York. Um, we've been in South America together. Uh, so many occasions by this wonderful art of ours, choral music, uh, and the way it does bring the world together. Uh, on the screen right now is a picture when you uh, told me that we would talk a little bit about our journeys together. This is the northern tip of the Philippines. And if you all will look at it, you'll see us celebrating um, by uh, uh, this expression here, uh, wild, the, the, the uh, South China Sea and the background there, the cliffs there in the northern Philippines. And then you see Fred, um, jumping and you see me jumping uh, and then you see the fellow with a really good jump behind us all the Filipino there um, we were together in a, a wonderful compound um, th that uh, we came together to do a retreat to try to plan some things for the International Federation for Choral Music and Fred and I found ourselves really living almost out uh, in nature. We were in a bungalow. Um, we had a bed at night that was surrounded by a, a mosquito net so that bugs would not get into our, uh, our bedding area. And Fred, what I remember the most was the very first morning that I was there, because there were animals all around our little bungalows, I remember there were chickens and there were goats and there were dogs just running around. And so I remember the first morning, I would hear this rooster go, and then I would hear this goat go, and then I would hear the dog go, and it was like four in the morning. It was very early and, and it woke me up, but it was this constant, and then, and then, well, after a while, there was a rhythm. It was a, it was a rhythm. So it went on for about 30 minutes, just like that. And then after 30 minutes, I was going to sleep because there was this rhythm of rooster, goat, dog. And then all of a sudden, this is what happened. I heard, ah, 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 and then I heard, ah, ah, and then I waited. And there was no dog. It woke me back up again because the rhythm <laughs> broke the rhythm. I said, oh, that's, that's it. I'm going to get up. So uh, we, we had a wild time together. We fished together. We, we were in the village together. And we found out that every afternoon the village folks would go out. They would get the net. They would bring in almost a, a quarter of a mile out in the ocean. They would bring in the fish. Then they would share them among each other. And the, the man that owned the net, he got to take the majority of the fish to the market. But all the village people that helped in the catch uh, got to cook for their own dinner. And Fred and I have had these kind of experiences in world cultures. And it's just really, uh, it, it, it's such an amazing, amazing journey that we've been together. But it's not always choral music, is it? Fred. <laughs> no, it's not always. 
with. Wow, yeah, those were great times and so funny. <laughs> and I remember the wonderful fish barbecue that we had about what you just told us. Well, maybe it's time to be a little bit serious also. The theme of today, tip how to be a successful choir and conductor. This is a great subject, maybe even overwhelming. And I would like to give you the floor uh, to you now, Tim, and uh, that you share some ideas with us about repertoire, stage presence, education, uh, voice technique, chorus, or whatever you are, what's in your mind in this field. Thank you, Fred. Well, we, we do get to hear many, many choirs, and I think what happens is uh, when you literally hear hundreds of choirs, the way uh, we have been able to do in the work that we do, and then we work with multiple choirs ourselves, um, it, naturally we develop some strong thoughts about um, what we can do to move a choir from being a good choir to a better choir to really what we often call some of the best choirs that we're able to hear. And uh, that does come and bring to me to mind the things that I have heard that, that really separates the, the good emerging choirs from the, the better and best. And I, I will say to all conductors, um, something that Robert Shaw um, used to say to those of us in uh, the United States, uh, Robert Shaw was sort of the Eric Erickson, if you will, for uh, our country, um, and I'm sure they were friends because uh, um, the world was much, I think, smaller then, and the choral directors that were international um, did really um, get to see each other and work together, not unlike we are, but, but I think back in those days, um, the big names such as Shaw and Erickson um, were, were very, very influential to us. And Robert Shaw used to say this. He said, there's no such thing as a bad choir. He said, there are only bad conductors. And I heard that as a young conductor, and I really thought about what does he mean by that? And, and I think what he, of course, means is that every choir has the potential of being uh, uh, great. It's what we do with them. And um, what we as conductors are able to do with the choir comes down to really our ears, what we hear, and, and then matching our ears to what we know is good pedagogy, our good, good conducting um, uh, uh, singing techniques. So knowing what to do and then having um, um, singers uh, and knowing where to apply it because of what we hear, that's our lifelong challenge. So what I say, first of all, uh, Fred, is that um, great conductors that are going to work with choir, first of all, it starts with score study. They really have to know what the composer or the arranger or the style or the intent of that music is. Uh, you really have to digest the score. You, you really can't stand in front of a group of people uh, and have them sing without knowing what the music is trying to say. That has to be in our head. And I always start with the score. And when I say score, I mean every note, every rhythm, every phrase, every nuance that's in there, the conductor really has to challenge. That's why we're always studying the score and looking at the score and marking it and internalizing it so that we start with score study. Now, we build on that, but I'll, I would like to lay that out, Fred, as my first thought. You got to study and analyze the score and know it really well. Yeah, thank you so much, because that reminds me of what Eric, my, my teacher, told me, uh, which, you know, when you are young and you want to be a musician and it's all, all, all about making music. And then Eric uh, told us that, well, uh, to, to be a conductor, that's 90% administration, 10% music making, because that is exactly what you are saying, that preparation, the preparation is crucial. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Preparation. And then secondly, I say you have to, you, you will be developing your voice your entire life, your, your conductor's voice, what you're trying to do, the sound you want, uh, the way you approach vowels, the way you approach phrases, that's going to be uh, changing all your life. As you hear great choirs and you listen to wonderful ensembles, you're, you're going to think, wow, how did they do that? And then you'll work at that. So you have to have something in mind and you have to have a sound idea ideal and and you'll spend your whole life i mean i think a lot of conductors young conductors want to have that immediately 
Uh, but most of us are not gifted enough to say, uh, as young conductors, that, we, that we've we heard a lot, we we've uh, know it all. We're always going to be adding to it. So I think you will always be developing, but you got to have something in your mind that you're trying to work for. It's, it's that wonderful image of... Um, Michelangelo and the statue of this in the stone that you have to have an image of what David looks like in order to carve David out of the stone and that's what conductors do they have a image of the music what they want and then they spend the rehearsal chipping away at what doesn't look like David you know <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah so uh, and what about voice technique in chorus on because i'm a singer myself as you know and and uh, when i'm traveling around uh, i'm talking about our vowels you know and the swedish language if you are not in dialect in the south part of course but we are very straight in the vowels yeah. we have the a e e u and so on mm -hmm. and then you have the many languages that that uh, those uh, uh, different vowels that goes in together in in uh, trip tongues even <laughs> even yeah. so uh, what is your idea about that because it re also uh, th those uh, vowels reflects also the overtunes absolutely yes absolutely yeah the the vowels of course are the essence of beautiful tone uh, i like to kid around a lot that my consonants are probably as pretty as pavarotti's consonants but my vowels are, are are where the beauty really distinguishes the beautiful singers and uh and choral of course we're lining up vowels our entire experience we're making sure that the vowel shapes are uh unified and uh, that is critical for a conductor, uh, con choral conductor. The vowels have got to be understood. The shapes have got to be unified in order to get a overtone, to get a clarity. Uh, we, we're dealing with very small vibration differences. Um, and and when, when vowels aren't lined up, we get a different set of, as you said, overtones. So getting those vowels completely lined up and unified, as we say in the United States, unified, um, uh, that is the key for me for beautiful singing. And then after that, I, I really work at shaping the tone um, after I get the vowels completely lined up. Uh, without vowel uh, uh, lining, we really are uh, not dealing with a clear ensemble. So that takes a lot of close hearing. And I find, Fred, I don't know about in Sweden, but in the United States, what's coming out of a person's mouth is not all, always what they think they're doing. So there's not a direct connection to, between just telling someone to shape a vowel and the way they really shape a vowel. So uh, it's it's not just as easy as commanding it. Uh, a lot of times it's really watching uh, and it's also, uh, in, in fact, drilling, making sure that it's very, very clearly understood. Because like you said, in Sweden, you have a vowel e, e, that we don't have in the United States. And if we don't get that right, you know that we're faking it. We're not singing uh, uh, the right sounds. Uh, my Chinese friends like to talk about their, you know, their, their a tonal language. I think we're all a tonal language. I think every nation has a tonal uh, aspect to their language. And I think the Chinese understand that well. And I like to apply that idea to my choirs, Western choirs, to say, we're also a tonal language. We, we, we do that through the way we manipulate vowels and other things. So um, that is a lifelong pursuit to be sure as a conductor. Absolutely. You are talking about shaping beautiful tones and uh, you are also a composer and you have composed a mass called the High Lonesome Bluegrass Mass. We are going to listen to a part of the credo, Believe. But please, before do we do that, tell us uh, why this, how did that come into your mind to make a, a mass in this setting and what is the setting? Yes, the setting is, um, it's a fusion, it's a mashup, if you will, of three things. First of all, there is a uh, underlying uh, cantus firmus of a uh, Appalachian tune that comes from the American uh, Appalachian region. That's the eastern part of the United States, the mountain range there. The early immigrants into the United States came from Scotland and Ireland and England and Wales and Ulster Island, Northern Ireland, Ireland. And when they came, they brought their tunes with them. And of course, the very first settlements were there in those areas because that's as far as you could go before you hit some very big 
mountain ranges. So a lot of those tunes resided in the people that settled in the Appalachian mountain region. And the tunes that I based this mass on really come from those areas. So that's the basis of the tune. The texts were uh, words that later people put on top of those uh, tunes in order to make them religious uh, tunes. They weren't originally, you know, even a tune that people tend to know around the world, the Amazing Grace, that wasn't originally a uh, religious song. The words were added later to make it a religious song, but the tune was actually a, a ballad that came from Ireland or Northern Ireland. And that's the truth of many, many of these songs. So I based the tunes on the tunes that came from that tradition. The texts are sacred texts that were later laid on it. And I arranged all that in a style in the United States we call bluegrass style, which is a much more of a folk group of instruments, banjo, mandolin, guitar, uh, violin, and bass. And that combination of folk tunes using the Latin mass, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Credo, the uh, Agnus Dei, the Sanctus, using the, that form, I matched the Latin mass with these tunes and text and put it in bluegrass style. So it's a mashup, but it's meant to be a choral work accompanied by bluegrass instruments. And fortunately, there was nothing like it when I when I wrote it, and it uh, it's had some popularity in the United States. Uh, this uh, CD that uh, I actually have um, here it's the one that we did get a Grammy nomination for. We didn't win, but it's still nice to be nominated. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's about a 30 minute work. And I, as you said, I play banjo. So I really kind of wrote it for myself to have something that I could play. Uh, and I conduct and play banjo at the same time, which breaks every rule in the book. Okay. <laughs> into the other topic of today, preparing a choir for a competition. What ideas, help, challenges, and benefits do you see? I remember, oh, uh, again, what Eric said when we arranged the competition here in Sweden for many years now, uh, uh, a long time ago, and, and he said, the very day when the choir has decided to take part in a choral competition, some month, coming uh, from, from that uh, part. The, immediately, the choir has raised the quality of 10%. I yeah. love that expression. <laughs> but because, uh, the, well, the idea what it meant that, that the whole group decided for one common goal, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, how, what, what do you think about this? That's a great, great uh, point. Uh, it's a mindset, isn't it? Your mindset is lifted already and saying, look, this is not normal. We're going to do something special. So I love that quote. I would say two things, Fred, about competitions. And you and I have listened to, again, hundreds and hundreds of choirs. I mean, we, we often listen to uh, dozens a day. And here's two things that I would say to anybody thinking about a competition. Number one, you should perform that program 
many times before you bring it to a competition. Perform it in your local town, perform it for multiple audiences, uh, perform it in concert. Don't let the competition be the first time you present that piece. Your choir needs to own that music and live that music as if they wrote it themselves. Um, because the choirs that win our competitions over and over, they portray a solidity that says they're at one with the music. And you can't do that if it's your first performance. So I would say perform it many times before you bring it to competition. And the second thing, Fred, I would say is um, remember that the performance of that piece of music starts in the dressing room. Don't think that you start performing when you when you open your mouth, when you're conductor. You, when you walk on stage as a choir, from the very moment you come in there, start thinking, uh, I'm, I am a performer of this music. I, I am going to change the life of this audience uh, as a group, as an individual. Uh, know that you're performing the, when you walk, sort of like Eric is saying, and that is, the moment you decide you're, to, you're doing it, start saying to yourself, we are going to be performers and, and visually knock this audience out. Whatever comes out of our mouth has to be excellent. We know that, but we're going to look excellent. We're not only going to dress excellent. Our faces, our expression, our bodies are going to say, we are capturing you as an audience. And I would say those two things separate choirs to me that are really good from the best. Those two elements, I would really encourage uh, our listeners and our conductors to think about. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, when I, we have been judging many times, as you, as you said, and when you have an excellent choir, you, 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 you set your points uh, and it goes because you hear very soon very, very fast. It's a matter of seconds when you know the, the quality. Uh, uh, what is your idea when you have, you know, the choirs who love what they are doing? They, they love to sing, but they will never have a gold medal because they are not in that. But, you know, for me as a conductor and I've been living that my whole life, I would like to encourage everyone how do you, what is your idea how to encourage a choir where you know after five seconds this choir will not be a gold choir? Yes, yes. Well, I would go back to your wonderful statement that Eric Erickson said is that if you care enough to come to this event, you already show that you want to you want to be um, a special group, that you you want to lift the bar, right? You you're basically saying. I'm doing this so that my choir can get better. So that mindset is that 10% that you're talking about, or 15%. You're, you're already on the tr tr uh, road, but the conductor, it's the director that's going to make the difference. So when the director gets the comments, the director should really read, of course, and study those comments and make it a goal to say, next time we come, we're going to raise it don't think we'll necessarily win. Think I'm going to raise my score ten points, or I'm going to raise my score five points. Don't don't think I'm going to next next year I'm going to come back and we're going to win gold. Think more like next year I'm going to come back and I'm going to do the things, the vowels, the phrasing, the consonants, um, whatever whatever the judges gave to you. Treat it like a gift. Um, and, and say, I am going to use those points and raise my choir five points. I think, F Fred, that, that part of the problem is, is really the conductor's expectations need to be um, like, where can I really go and, and how fast can I bring this up? But the fact that they want to should be their more important um, guiding star, I think, than uh, the, the thought that all of a sudden something's going to change. Because the, the things that made the choir just barely, you know, making a score, those things are are, are true, very thoughtful areas of choral performance that we all think are important. So really, it's up to the conductor to move it up the scale a little bit. That's what I would say to them. And if they, if anyone ignored that, I would say that's just not, that's not the way the world was created. It was, it was not created with a magic button. It was created with, with increments of improvement. Yes. 
Thank you, Tim, for all that you have been sharing with us here. And could you please make a short summarize? You know, in the beginning, I talked about the bullet points, and uh, I hope we can have those visible uh, along when you explain your bullet points, please. Sure, Fred, thank you. Yeah, these are the things that I really live by as I uh, work for my with my own choirs and as I uh, adjudicate other choirs. Uh, the very first thing, as I said, is you, the conductor has to know the score. Uh, know the score thoroughly. The book that you uh, put on the screen at the beginning of our program was my analysis of 177 choral pieces. The book is 1,119 pages long, and it's all about choral analysis. It's all about analyzing every note in the score. And my teacher, one of my teachers, Margaret Hillis of the Chicago Symphony Chorus, she used to say, if you want to learn a score quickly, study it slowly. And I would say uh, by that, she means measure by measure, know the score. So number one, I have to say is analysis of the score and internalizing the score. Secondly, um, the preparation for the event uh, has got to be uh, thorough with your choir and know that uh, you need to perform it and, and actually uh, offer it often before you actually bring it to a competition. Uh, don't let the competition be the first time you've sung something in front of an audience. Make sure you've done it multiple times and know that your preparation really begins uh, as you go into the theater or as you go on the stage. It begins the moment you get off the bus or the moment you put your dress on. That's, that's when you start getting your head into the music. The third thing is a beautiful tone. What we want to hear from choirs is really a beautiful singing. We want to hear tone that transforms us, that brings us into the music and captures us. And in order to do that, the tone really needs to be uh, oriented around vowels, beautiful aligned vowels that have uh, vibrant singing um, and, and very, of course, that that's a given that intonation is wonderful, that, that we're in tune, that we're uh, actually um, uh, shaping a phrase that the line is uh, has architecture to it. So those elements I want to hear in the beautiful tone and phrases that a choir sings. Um, the um, the other thing too, Fred, is I listen to choirs around the world. Um, the, re the reason the choir is an instrument and not a collection of just pretty singers or a bunch of people, the reason the choir is an instrument is because we work on balance and blend. So I, I want to tell conductors, make sure that that choir within each section has a balance and has a blend in the sound because that's what makes a choir a choir. Not a whole bunch of different voices singing pretty, but a, a section of altos or a section of basses that are blended together using vowels and, and exact consonants and exact rhythms and all of that put together in a blended sound that says this is an instrument. This is a single instrument. And then finally, I think the performance has to be uh, mesmerizing and that when the audience listens to it, they are captured by visual presentation as much as they're captured by the oral uh, presentation. Those things are really what makes a difference for me when I listen to a choir. Thank you so much. Now I turn to our lovely audience here today and ask if someone of you has a question that you would like to put to Tim. So please open your mics and give a question if you have. And I, I have a question actually. There are so many interesting things that you have, uh, that we have heard about and that you have shared with us, uh, but I'm a little bit curious and I would really like to know what is your next project? Well, thank you. Thanks for asking. Yes, thank you for asking. Um, I have uh, pro two projects. So the one I've just finished, I, I actually here, um, I'm here in Atlanta right now. I have the book. It's probably hard to see. There it is. Look at that. Ah, that looks pretty cool. It's called Angel Band, and it's a uh, it's a composition that I um, 
that I worked on that has some of these folk song material, but it's a Christmas work. It's all uh, folk material ranged for choir, and it was just published this year during COVID. It was published, and so I'm looking forward to getting that work out and following up my High Lonesome Mass with a little bit more of a traditional kind of piece, not, not as much bluegrass, uh, but actually um, um, more uh, calm Christmas type of uh, pieces that are really good for the Christmas season. And if I, I do have a Magnificat in there that has a bluegrass uh, movement to it, so uh, I will have that going as well. And then um, I actually have a tune in there, believe it or not, that is a Swedish tune. Uh, I set a Swedish tune to the um, uh, text while shepherds watch their flock by night. And it, I'm not going to say the Swedish right, but I'm going to try it, Fred. It's the Tva Konunga Barnen. The Tva Konunga Barnen. It's um, uh, while shepherds watch their flocks by night. All seated on the ground. And that's the beginning. And then, fear not, said he, for mighty dread had seized their troubled mind. You all know that tune? No, oh, no, I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry to say, maybe it's a Scandinavian song. <laughs> it's, I found it in a Swedish collection, and I uh, love the tunes. Anyway, the work Thank is coming. Thank you for learning us. Thank you for learning me a new song today, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have time for another question, maybe. Wow. Yeah. Go, go yes. ahead. Yes. I have also a, a, a question here. You have done a lot of projects, but what, what project in the past have you loved the most? Ah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think, in a way, I'm most proud of a little work I did 30 years ago, and it's called Christmas Messiah for Young Voices. I took the Christmas portion of Handel's Messiah, and I reduced some of the choruses for unison and two-part children's choir. So, for unto us a child is born, hallelujah chorus, a glory to God from the Messiah, I reduced it so young children could sing just the melody and just a slight bit of canonic counterpoint. Uh, and then I put a lot of the Handelian part in the accompaniment so their ears of adults would say, oh yeah, that's, that's Handel, but the children were singing a reduced portion. Well, I did it for the young children in my church choir, uh, but it caught on and actually it sold multiple thousands of copies. And one of my friends in, um, in um, um, Uppsala, Sweden, uh, actually does it with her children's choir there at the cathedral often. It's called Christmas Messiah for Young Voices. It's been out for 30 years. And I'm really proud because what I wanted to do was introduce children at a young age to these wonderful, great works. And hopefully they would grow up to want to sing them in the real SATB version, but falling in love with them as children. So that sort of worked. And now 30 years later, I'm seeing it actually work. So uh, it's one of those kind of things that I didn't know where it would go. And it started with really good purposes, but it bloomed into something that I'm, I'm very proud of. Wow, that's lovely. Uh, some more question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have uh, two questions. I wonder how many choirs do you have yourself? And um, are you working in a different way with uh, uh, different uh, ages of your choirs? If it's a children choir or adult choir or uh, youth choir? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Gunnel. Yes. Uh, right now, I'm working with an adult church choir, a community church choir. And I also have a very large symphonic community choir that is, one is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the other one is in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live. So I fly to Tulsa uh, once a week and work with my large symphonic choir. We're doing Handel's Israel in Egypt, and we're working on Morton Lordson's Luke Saterna right now. And then with my church choir, we're actually working on Haydn's Creation, 
and of course Sunday by Sunday uh, music for our church services. So I have a very good choir in Nashville and a large symphonic choir. Uh, I, I, when I was, before I worked at ACDA, I was a college choir director, so I had a collegiate choir, and they toured, and then when I was early in my work, I did have children and youth choirs, but I have not done those choirs in several years. I have several youth singers that are in my older choirs, but I'm not working with children right now, but I am writing some children's pieces uh, because I still love uh, to, to work with and, and, and adjudicate and help children's choirs. So really right now I have a symphonic choir and a, a nice church choir. Thank you so much. I know that you would like to share some more music with us. Please, before we listen to the next one, get us in the right mood. What is this? <laughs> yeah, my next piece is uh, a piece that I wrote when I was on sabbatical leave in Cambridge, England. Uh, I was there as a guest of um, uh, uh, David Wilcox, uh, uh, one of my mentors that was in, uh, of course, many years at King's. And then his uh, successor, Stephen Cleberry, invited me along with Tim Brown there in Cambridge and John Rudder. Those, those were sort of the hosts for me for a year in Cambridge. And while I was there, I sang, they gave, they give the men and boys Monday off at King's Chapel. And so on Monday, there is a, another choir that comes in for the Monday evening even song. And for one year I got to sing in those choir stalls in England at King's College Chapel um, and of course it was an out-of-body experience to be in that space singing and I was inspired in that setting that year to write this piece which is the Fos Hilaron uh, text that says uh, now as we come to the setting of the sun and our eyes behold the vesper light we sing with happy voices I've I always loved that text from the Book of Common Prayer. So inspired by King's Chapel, I wrote this piece. Thank you. How beautiful that was. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I know from experience uh, as a director of many festivals and concerts that many, many things happen behind the scenes, what we call backstage. Uh, I must just tell you, uh, when you talk about Robert Shaw, you know, when we had the, the, the IFCM uh, the event in Stockholm 90, he, uh, Robert Shaw was invited to conduct the Brahms Requiem. Uh, in the concert hall in the radio. So he was coming there, Maestro Show, and uh, he was coming to the, to the, to the door uh, and there was no one, it was locked and there was some boom, 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 boom. And then there come this guy, he was quite, you know, not very socializing because uh, I mean, everyone in our world recognized Robert Shaw, right? And said, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> Show, who he's a very polite, wonderful, was fantastic person. Well, I think I'm going to conduct here. <laughs> <laughs> and that he, and the, in, inside this was a Swedish radio symphony orchestra, this radio choir, the, the chamber choir, 
I think, I'm going to conduct. You must have been living some uh, through many of those kind of funny stories. So would you mind sharing us an ACDA uh, thing <laughs> or something else? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's funny. I, I just I would hate to be the person that had to say, "What do you want?" Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, um, yeah, lots of stories, Fred. I mean, I produced something like fifty-seven, fifty-eight national and regional conferences during my thirteen years, and uh, you know, we performed major works at every one of them with uh, you know really star. Uh, soloists and star conductors. I think the one that probably stands out most in my mind is because is one that I had such high expectations for. Uh, back in 2013, uh, uh, the National Conference was in Dallas, and I had gone to all the military choirs in the United States and said, look, you all fall outside of our regular uh, kind of parameters and outside of our regular type of choirs, but I really want to feature you because you are, you are truly professional choirs. In the United States, like your radio choir, in the United States, we pay taxes, and the only choir choirs that are supported by U.S. taxes are the military choirs, and they're really very good. So I went to all the services, the Air Force, the Army, the National Guard, and the, uh, the Navy, and they all have choirs. And I said, what if we put all of your choirs together, the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the National Guard, the Air Force, and I said, would you all be willing? They said, oh, that's fantastic. We'll do that. And I said, okay, what does it take to, I'm, I'm talking three years before the conference. And uh, they said, uh, here's what I, they gave me a, a short list of the things that I could do to make it possible, which meant talking to generals and, uh, you know, de defense depart the defense department and all kinds of things that are outside of my norm, but I was determined to do it. And, um, and I said to them, what work do you want to do? And they said, we would like to do the Benjamin Britten War Requiem. And I thought, oh, goodness, the, the, this is a requiem about peace and to have all these military uh, men and women singing a, a requiem of peace uh, by Britain and in their own uniforms, you know, the Army and the Navy in their uniforms. I said, what a fantastic. So I put it together. Everything was going to happen. And then Mr. Obama was our president at that time. And he, about one month before my conference, he cut all the funding for anything that could happen outside of Washington, D.C. So they couldn't come. And all of a sudden, I had a national conference. I had been advertising this. So I had to turn the whole thing around get choirs in Dallas, which of course I could get, I could get the best choirs anywhere. There was no problem about that, but I only had one month to do it. And so we, we got it down to everything was, we got new choirs. We had the military guys that wanted to sing as civilians. They could still sing, but they weren't going to wear their uniform so that they wouldn't look like they were spending money tax money on that. So we had figured it out. We were sneaking around behind the, the government's back to do it. I was going to make it happen. So I was there. I was exhausted, Fred. I had been working on this, and, and it had been a month of just complete, unbelievable work. And I was getting ready to go on, and I thought, I, I just thank God that we were finally there. And I looked around, and the tenor was, the ten, I couldn't find the tenor. The tenor was nowhere to be found. And I thought, of all the work that I did, I forgot to think, remember, you got to give special attention to that tenor. <laughs> so the tenor was wandering around somewhere in the building. We found him, but I thought, oh, my gosh, it always comes down to a, a tenor soloist, doesn't it? So <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Wow. Uh, thank you so much for share, sharing this. After playing it, maybe one of the most important roles in the choral life in the United States for so many years, then you decided to take another step in your life. How did that feel? And uh, of course, we want to know what is your dreams for the future? Thank you, Fred. Well, thank you. And uh, it was a wonderful time. I decided that at, at 
um, at my point in life that I had really done what I had wanted to accomplish, and I really had a piece that I had kind of done everything that needed to be done, and it was COVID came along, and I decided at that point um, that I really didn't want to rebuild, like we're all having to rebuild, right? We're all having to start over again, and I thought that really provided a good point for me to step aside and let someone else come back, because it's going to mean rebuilding in everybody's uh, work. And I thought that would be a good time because um, I wanted to spend more time with my family. I wanted to spend more time because I've traveled like you. We've, we've traveled the world. My family doesn't always go with me. But um, I decided it's time for me to spend more time with uh, traveling with my family. With, and I wanted to speak with my mother, my brother. And so I moved back to Nashville where I grew up, Nashville, Tennessee. And I love writing music and I love um, that kind of work. So we bought a farm and I have cows and I have goats and I have chicken. And I, I write music and I go out and conduct my own music and I conduct my choirs. And I'm really enjoying uh, not administrating right now, but rather you know, truly making music 100% of the time. So that's what's next for me. And I couldn't be happier doing that. And of course, I wish my I'm always going to be an ACDA person. I'm, I'm a lifetime member. I was a member before I became executive director, so that is always in my heart. But right now, I'm really excited about writing music and conducting music uh, all the time. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow, that sounds really, really wonderful. Uh, congratulations to your new style and the, you know, the new life. Thank you. So we're coming to the end of this show. Uh, and I have a final question to you, and that's a very special one. Uh, as a conductor and a pedagogue and director, we all, uh, uh, I love the expression, serve above yourself. I mean, that we are at service for the choral community, either domestic or internationally or both. And you have really been one who has been both domestic and internationally. And now it comes, looking back into your outstanding life and career, when you summarize, what is your personal feeling? What have you been good for? I hope you can accept that hard question, Tim. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, what we in the United States, we have that, uh, we have an expression when people say, well, that's good for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's good for nothing, yeah. But I think, truthfully, uh, seriously, what I would hope would be on my uh, my epitaph uh, in my at the end of my life was that I really was able to inspire um, people that that um, that my life inspired someone else's life. Um, I feel like if my spirit um, inspired them, that honestly, that I will live on. Um, that even when my when my work is done that my inspiration in some way will live on in that in that spirit. And of course, inspire is that at the heart of breath. And breath is what we use as our primary source for choral singing. So I like the word inspire. I believe it has everything to do with choral music. And I, I really would like to think that my work inspired my students, my singers, my audiences, um, that my colleagues that I'm, I'm with in the Philippines, uh, wherever I am, um, I hope that my life would have been an inspiration to, to somebody else. And then I will feel like that that was, that was good, that that was, worth, um, that was worth the work. That was wonderful answer. Thank you so much for that. Really, really. Dear Tim, uh, the time has come to say goodbye. And I'm so very happy, happy and honored that you have been with us here today in the show Conductors Talk. And uh, as a special appreciation to you, we would like to play some minutes from a, a recording of Beethoven's Mass in C, ah. you conducting. And uh, please tell us about the setting and the special circumstances of that recording. <laughs> well, thank you for surprising me with that. Um, you know, when COVID hit, we were all scrambling to fa figure out what are we going to do with our, how are we going to keep our choirs excited? What are we going to do? And I was working on the Beethoven Mass in C, and then COVID hit, and I decided that I would take my choir uh, 
uh, one at a time or section at a time, instrument at a time, and we recorded the first two movements of the Beethoven Mass in C virtually in a recording studio. And the fun thing is this, Fred, I put it together in a video and we have in the United States uh, outdoor drive-in movie theaters. Do you have those in Sweden where you can actually drive your car and see a movie on a big screen outdoors? No, not uh, not on a normal base. With some is in some special occasion we build it up, but uh, very very seldom, I would say. Well, these were these were very popular in the 1950s and 60s, and then of course people came inside and they go to movies in in theaters. But they became popular again a few years ago because they were still out there, and people uh, started going to see movies outdoors. So you sit in your car. There's a speaker right by the car window, and you watch it. Uh, and you can take a whole family. So you sit in your car, you eat popcorn, and you watch a movie. But so I decided to record the Beethoven Mass in C and to show it at an outdoor drive in theater. And because people couldn't go into spaces, but I figured they could drive their cars and come to this theater. So we had over 700 cars drive to the theater. <laughs> And we showed our movie, which was Beethoven, Mass and C. Now, truth is, I also paired it with the Beatles movie, A Hard Day's Night, because I wanted, I didn't know if people would actually come to the movie to see Beethoven, but I figured maybe they would come to see the Beatles, Hard Day's Night. So I called it Beethoven and the Beatles. It was the 250th birthday of Beethoven and the 60th birthday of the Beatles. So I provide the Beatles and they watched uh, the hard day's night. We had 700 cars come. It was amazing. It was fantastic. Oh wow! You are truly bringing inspiration into the world. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, with this uh, wonderful piece of music, we are saying a big thank you to you, Tim. Again, wonderful to have you, and uh, thank you the audience for being here. Thank you visitors for looking at us. And we say over and out until next time, goodbye. And here comes Beethoven. <laughs>
two, one, smile.